I'm extremely pleased to introduce Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, and I'll say this. For science to progress, we need new ideas. About half of the scientists in the world hate new ideas. We also need to re-examine ideas that everybody agrees are true, and some of those ideas are moldy and have to be looked at again. Dr. Sheldrake has been a pioneer in both departments, and his work means a lot to me. Um, the origin of biological form to me is the most important unsolved mystery in science. Dr. Sheldrake has a brilliant idea about how form is created, and I'm going to talk about how it works in a couple days. So, without further ado, Dr. Sheldrake. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, um, partly because I think this water conference is a model of what scientific conferences could be, open-minded, broad-based, and inclusive. Also because Jerry Pollack, who's such an inspiration for all of us, um, corresponds so closely to my ideal scientist. When I was a child and wanted to be a scientist, I thought that all scientists would be like Jerry Pollack and um, open-minded, curious, um, and uh, unpompous. Um, I soon discovered that actually there aren't very many Jerry Pollacks. In fact, there's only one. Um, um, so anyway, I'm very pleased to be here. And what I'm talking about this morning is something I've never talked about before, um, namely water. Um, because... It's a water conference, and I have, over the years, done uh, some research involving water. So this is... Uh, what I'm going to be talking about now is something none of you would have heard before, um, because I haven't done it before. Um, of course, I'll touch on various themes that are familiar to you, um, and one of them is vibratory patterns in water. I think one of the problems within the sciences in general is that in the 1950s, when analog computers and digital computers were both viable options, everything went down the digital computing route. And that's given us many benefits. But analog computers model processes by creating processes, uh, rather than trying to break them down into yes and no bits and then kind of reconstruct them from granular atomistic elements. And analog computing provides models of nature which are actually much easier to understand and uh, are in many cases much more appropriate than digital computing. And this is often true of phenomena and processes involving waves. We now know that wave phenomena lie at the very heart of matter. Quantum physics is all about waves and wave patterns. And... Uh, you can, of course, model those to some degree with equations, but the, the more complex the wave patterns, the more difficult the modeling becomes. But you can also model them with waves themselves. And the reason I'm so interested in modeling with waves is because I think that the underlying processes in morphogenesis, in chemistry, molecules, crystals, and biology, um, are to do with what I call morphogenetic fields. And these are basically vibratory fields of activity. They're wave-like and rhythmic. So uh, one way into understanding um, patterns of vibration is through analog model systems. And vibratory patterns were first studied... Um, well, Leonardo da Vinci was one of the first to observe that when you vibrated piles of dust, they formed patterns. And Chladni, uh, who did the classic work on Chladni patterns on vibrating plates, showed that if you vibrate a plate uh, and you have particles on it like um, pollen or spores or sand, then 
the patterns are formed as it lines up on the nodes of the vibratory patterns. And here's a whole series of patterns on vibratory plates showing the, how form arises from frequency. Uh, these particular patterns were produced by Alexander Lauterwasser. Now, Michael Faraday uh, was very interested in these patterns, and he was a very curious and open-minded scientist. And he started looking at them in water. And Faraday discovered that if you vibrate water, you get patterns on the surface, ripples. Um, if you have sloping edges to the container, these ripples fade out like waves breaking on a beach, a sandy beach. But if you have vertical walls of the container, they're reflected, and you get standing wave patterns, and these standing wave patterns are called Faraday waves, after Faraday. Well, it's now possible to study these with a pre precision never before possible, thanks to the uh, development of the cymoscope by John Stuart Reed, who's here uh, at this conference. And um, my son Merlin and I uh, have got a cymoscope laboratory at our home in London. Um, there it is. Um, the cymoscope's in the middle. Uh, it contains, it has um, a coil that vibrates up and down. Um, and there's a small container here, about two centimeters in diameter, with a small volume of fluid. So, um, and there's a camera that takes, uh, there's the camera and here's a light ring that gives, uh, illuminates it. And in this you can control the frequency and the amplitude and, um, and do repeatable experiments. This is a, um, shows you the kind of pattern you get You see, that was a three-fold pattern with standing waves that oscillate backwards and forwards. Um, so it gives you a six-fold pattern altogether. This is another one. Um, this is an eight-fold pattern. And by vibrating at different frequencies, you get a series of patterns, six-fold, eight-fold, ten-fold, twelve-fold, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, and it goes up further. So there are these symmetry patterns, and these are, as it were, resonant frequencies um, that uh, appear. When you go up through the spectrum, oh, this, is, this one shows, this is a composite, which is what you get if you take exposures fairly uh, unless you have very quick exposures. With very, very quick exposures, you can see this is an alternation between this pattern and this pattern. This is an alternation between this and this. And so what you're seeing normally is the composite. We went up through an entire spectrum from 50 to 200 hertz. And you get ranges, these are replicates, these three lines. Um, and you get periods when there's no pattern and then you get into an area where you get a particular pattern, and then you get into no pattern again. It's a bit like old-fashioned radios, where you tune the radio set, and you get a station, and then there's a kind of noise in between, and then you get the next station. So you, tune, you come in and out of these resonant frequencies. And they show an order, as you go up from the bottom here, 6, 8, 4, 10, 6, 12, 8. It doesn't seem to have any logical sequence. But when you plot them on a graph, you see a very distinct series of patterns. These are, this is increasing frequency here from 50 to 200 hertz. And this is the foldness of the pattern with three replicates. 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 is missing, 16, 18, 20. Then it all starts over again, 6, 8, 10, 12, and then again. So you see, we have these harmonic uh, frequencies. The only way of modeling these mathematically seems to be using Bessel functions, which are really those like vibrating drum membranes. Um, so there's an order in, in all this, which is what you'd expect, really, with waves and patterns. 
When we look at the more detailed uh, patterns, we find that these, these are like basins of attraction. This is frequency. These are the patterns that we get at these frequencies. And this is the amplitude needed, the minimum amplitude needed to create the pattern. And this, this is like a, a, a tractor, a well. And uh, there's a period point here where you get the pattern very clearly uh, with the minimum energy. And there's an area around it where these patterns, uh, you get, have to have more energy to make them happen. This is a resonance pattern. And if you look at the vibrations at these bits in between, um, what you see is something on the cusp of, it's, it's, it's what, what chaos mathematicians call a chaotic pattern, where it's drawn between two attractors. So this is at the cusp between two of those patterns. Well, you've, you've got the idea that in between there's this kind of inst unstable um, area. Um, one of the people who's done most research on this in relation to biological forms is Alexander Lauterwasser here in Germany. And what he's shown is that uh, these radially symmetrical patterns that you get vibra vibrating water uh, have distinct analogues in um, biological forms like flowers. Um, and they also have analogues in radially symmetrical structures. These are pollen grains. Uh, each of these are from different species, and each species has a particular um, pattern of the pollen grain. These are single cells. And why this is important is that current thinking about biological morphogenesis is heavily molecular, and most biologists think it all happens just by switching on and off genes. But in a single cell, uh, switching on and off genes can't explain the morphogenesis of a single cell because the genes are the same for the whole cell and what's switched on and off is the same for the whole cell. So how does a cell, a single cell, create complex form? Well, I think the only answer is through a morphogenetic field. And instead of morphogenetic fields being conceived of as they currently are, primarily in terms of diffusing chemicals, I think they're actually vibratory patterns. And when you see those vibratory patterns and you see these radially symmetrical structures, these are radiolarians, which are also single cells. They live in the sea, single-celled organisms with silicaceous skeletons. Again, I think that the underlying morphogenetic process must depend on waves, wave patterns of some kind, possibly acoustic waves, but more likely electrical wave patterns within the cell membranes. These are famous pictures of radiolarians by Ernst Haeckel. These um, forms, uh, uh, those are radially symmetrical forms, but vibratory patterns can also give rise to non-radially symmetrical patterns. Um, oh, this is just to remind you that radially symmetrical patterns appear in art. This is the tomb the dome of the tomb of Hafiz. And these are rose windows at Chartres um, and at Notre Dame. Um, and again, there's a limited number of radially symmetrical patterns. I'm not suggesting that they bought a cymoscope and uh, developed these as a result of uh, doing research with cymoscopes. But they, they, if you're interested in radial symmetry, there, there's a limited number of patterns you can arrive at. Um, now, could I, Pierre, could you help me with this one again? Because this is where we need a, a film. Uh, the film I'm about to show is again from Alexander Lauterwasser, and it shows an isolated drop of water being vibrated. And what's interesting is that it undergoes a kind of morphogenesis. It's free to move. And this looks exactly like an insect embryo with its segmented pattern. Um, it's a remarkable way that this spontaneously takes up this form. Lauterwasser is also very interested in tortoises. And in the middle you see a tortoise shell, and around that you see 
tortoise-shaped plates on which there's a powder. These are like Chladney figures. And um, as you see, you can get something very like a tortoise shell pattern through vibrations. Uh, these, these are like the nodes in the vibratory pattern. Um, so I myself think that biological morphogenesis is very largely vibration-based, um, electrical or acoustic vibrations, and that morphogenetic fields are fields of vibration. Um, and I think this is true also. We know it's true of atoms. We know that an atom is a vibratory pattern in quantum fields, vibrations in the quantum field. It's true of molecules. Uh, a benzene molecule, for example, has resonant uh, a ring of electrons around it. Crystals are vibratory structures, and so are organisms, and so are we. We have many vibrations in our bodies. We have stir rhythms like heartbeat, breathing, brain waves, and in fact, brains have vibratory patterns of activity which are probably much better modeled by uh, vibrating models like these than by digital computers trying to model what's happening in the brain. Now, when I was thinking about all this in preparation for this talk, I, was, uh, um, I recalled that there's a whole series of hydrodynamical models, including my own, uh, which work not on vibrations but on fluid flows, which are also a kind of analog computer. And this one is a model of the British economy that was produced in 1949 by someone called Phillips. Um, it's hydrodynamical. You have reservoirs with the money supply. You have flows that represent uh, income. You have diversions going into tax. Uh, you have uh, foreign assets here. Um, the uh, exports. Um, you have a pump at the bottom to get the money back up to the top. And it's all based on a series of tubes and flows, and you can change interest rates, um, uh, taxation rates by turning knobs and valves. And this model actually worked. It's called the Moniac computer, and they were manufactured in the 1950s. There are at least 40 of them in existence. They were bought by various governments, and for 10 years, the entire British economy was modeled by the UK Treasury using this Moniac computer. Here's the actual device. Um, uh, it has readouts where you can actually see graphs. It plots graphs, so you can actually model the economy in a way that's much more intuitively um, uh, recognizable than opaque pages of code, uh, which no one except computer experts can understand. Here, um, ministers of finance, etc., could actually see what happens when you change interest rates and so on, um, with coloured fluids running through. There are two or three working models in existence, one in New Zealand where it was used for modelling the New Zealand economy and one in Britain. Um, so when I spent um, quite a number of years doing research in India as a plant physiologist, I was the principal plant physiologist at the International Crops Research Institute in Hyderabad, India, where I was working on um, the physiology of two legume crops, chickpeas and pigeon peas. Chickpeas are small plants, um, also known as garbanzos, um, which are, are annuals. Pigeon peas are bushy plants, which are basically perennials. They're usually grown as annuals, but they're a perennial bush. And um, I was interested in how the pods develop. This is, and what I found was, uh, if you look at the formation of pods in pigeon peas, um, this is the first formed pods. And then you go along, these are later and later, as flowering goes on and on, they keep forming pods. And the number of seeds per pod remains fairly consistent. And the weight per seed remains fairly consistent. But in chickpeas, which are an annual, you see a completely different pattern. The number of the weight per pod, the number of... Uh, the seeds per pod and the weight per seed all decrease 
um, as you get to the later formed pods. I then discovered this is a basic principle of all annual and perennial crops, or at least all the ones I looked at, that in perennials, the later formed fruits are the same weight as the earlier formed fruits, but in annuals, they get smaller and smaller. And I think the reason is that a perennial has to hold something back for next year, whereas an annual plant gives everything it's got to forming seeds until it, it dies, it exhausts itself. It doesn't mind exhausting itself because it's going to die anyway. And I was then trying to think how to model them. And one of my colleagues who worked on serial physiology was trying computer models. And the code was incredibly hard to understand. The computer kept breaking down in the Indian climate. He spent most of his time trying to import spare parts. So I decided, uh, remembering this model of the British economy, that I'd produce a hydrodynamical model of pod set in the pigeon pea, which I did. Um, not a theoretical model, an actual one. Here's me actually um, making it out of rubber tubing and bicycle inner tubes and burette clips, uh, equipment readily available in India. Um, and here's a um, picture of the hydrodynamical model. The, there's a reservoir representing the amount of available sugar or food. There's a tube here representing the branch. And these are the pods. And when you open the valve, because there's a siphon here, um, there has to be a certain amount of fluid here before a pod will fill. What happens is this pod fills, then this starts filling and it fills, then this one fills, then this one fills, and it reaches a point where there's not enough fluid here to trigger the siphon. So you end up with a number of pods that are completely full and then the rest are empty. But if you reduce this threshold, lower this down until there's almost no siphon, no threshold, then they go on filling until the later ones are only partly full, until there's hardly anything in the last ones at all, exactly like the chickpea. And when I demonstrated this model to my colleagues in, in India, um, I and everybody else got what was going on straight away. And you could change the levels, you could move the height of the siphons, you could open and close the valves. <coughs> it was a much more informative model, and it helped us understand the physiological basis of pod set. And in fact, in plants, the sugars move around in tubes called the phloem, uh, and it really is a kind of hydrodynamical process. So modeling these processes hydrodynamically turns out to be much easier, much more comprehensible, uh, much more illuminating than spending, uh, than hiring lots of people to try to write pages and pages of code, all of which depends on theoretical assumptions. And when you don't know much about the system, you don't know if you've got the right assumptions. This way you can do it by trial and error. Now, when I was um, thinking about this talk and, and um, th this modeling process, I was amazed to find uh, a paper that came out uh, in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society just two weeks ago called A Brief History of Liquid Computers uh, by um, Andrew Adamatsky, who's at the, inter it's called the Unconventional Computing Lab in the University of the West of England. And he discovered a whole series of other hydrodynamical and liquid models, mainly water-based, um, including one here that involves jets of water going through valves. Um, this is actually used in engineering applications. And um, they, these, there's been an interest in various defense departments about these liquid computers. Because if there's ever a war or a serious international conflict, the very first thing that's going to happen is the entire uh, internet everything digital is going to be wiped out. A cyber warfare will take it out straight away. The only thing that will go on working is liquid computers. And uh, for message carrying, carrier pigeons. Um, the Swiss Army, till recently, had the only remaining carrier pigeon uh, corps in uh, Europe. I think the Chinese are the only people left with uh, military pigeons um, because they realize that they may actually need them one day. Um, so, uh, this example, um, he gives about seven or eight different examples 
of um, liquid com computation, which are very fascinating. Interestingly, there's a big fashion now for quantum computing. And quantum computing involves superposed quantum states. And quantum phenomena are wave phenomena. Basically, what's happening in quantum computing is a reinvention of analog computing. The problem with analog computing is that you have to have specific analog models. It's not like a generalized machine that can do everything. You have to make specific models. But now, if you look in Nature or other leading scientific journals, almost every two or three weeks, there's now a new analog computer model of chemical bonds, of molecular processes, and so on. Um, so I think, in fact, uh, there is uh, the beginning of a resurgence of analog computing. And even if we don't call it a computer, if we just call it uh, an analog model, um, I think that these water-based models um, are able to provide an enormous illumination uh, to many natural phenomena, which dense computer code and digital computers can't. So that's really what I wanted to say this morning, a, a, a fresh look at the world of computing and um, a, a, an appreciation of what we can learn from the dynamical properties of water, both through hyd hydrodynamical flows and through wave patterns. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.